Welcome to Nugget 381, Dinosaurs to Outer Space, The Impact. I thought, was it some impact that took the dinosaurs out? Supposedly a meteor. But that's not what we're going to be talking about, right? No. A little different impact. Yeah, just a wee bit. Well, we have noticed that decades ago, children were enamored by dinosaurs, right? Absolutely, they were. They're fascinated by them. And that was a tool the enemy used to take people away from the Bible. Every little boy I knew when I was a kid, they had all those little plastic dinosaurs. They were just consumed by dinosaur this and dinosaur that. Very few girls that I knew were, but I I never liked those things. And we had them in the meetings. I mean, kids would come in with t-shirts with a bunch of dinosaurs. They'd have toys all over the place, and they'd bring bags full of toys. Yeah, I actually had an eight-foot table, and it was filled with dinosaurs. And kids would come up all the time and grab one and knock the other ones off a little bit, you know, trying to create a fight or whatever. Everybody loved that table. And some kids brought their own dinosaurs. Yeah, they did. They wanted theirs to sit with the display for the week. And they stuck them up there. You want to tell them about Floyd? Yeah, they could play with anything they wanted to, but not Floyd. Floyd was a T-Rex that somebody made. It's a model. And he gave it to me. And he's delicate. So I was kind of Kept him aside. Well, it was kind of interesting. On display, but aside. It's interesting how we acquired Floyd. We had a meeting, and we had all the dinosaurs, and as we just mentioned, kids had brought their dinosaurs. And as we were picking up, we noticed that someone had left their dinosaur, and it was this really nice model. And so we asked the pastor... um, If he knew who did it. Yeah, because we weren't going to take it. No. Someone had left it, but why would they leave something that looks so good? And what did he tell you? He said, well, it's... Probably for you. They've probably given it to you. I said, no, no, this is a nice dinosaur. I don't think that just, somebody just brought it in and they accidentally left it. But no, he said, no, you need to take it and I'll find out. And then... He said, if you need to return it, so be it. So we took Floyd and Floyd's been with us for a couple of decades now. And what was really neat at about the 10-year mark, we were in a small town in Vermont and you were going to be interviewed at a radio station. And guess who was the interviewer? <laughs> Of all people. It was Floyd's dad. Yeah, so that was neat. And so he was just so tickled that Floyd was living on the road. He was thrilled that we still had him. Okay, so back to this impact. Now that you know that Floyd has had a big impact on our lives, what is the point of this nugget today, Steve? Well, the latest several magazines uh, that I've gotten, they all have space something on the covers. We're going to go through one Scientific American specifically, and uh, there are actually eight articles that either talk about dinosaurs or space. That's what we're trying to point out to people. And the enemy is kind of using space issues to take people away from the Bible, to to challenge their faith. Well, this science news says red planet Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, we need Wi-Fi on Mars. Yeah, kind of like that phone to the moon. Anyway, I didn't say that. They're okay. really trying to get Wi-Fi on Mars. But we, can't we even, don't have a good signal right here where we are. We can't even get good cell service in Colorado or Kansas. So yeah. maybe we do need to go to Mars to get good Wi-Fi service. Then, but we'll talk about that article actually one day because uh, they're talking about wanting to communicate with Earth. Via Wi-Fi? <laughs> go figure. And then all eyes on the eclipse. And we know that is... A huge thing, and a lot of people in the United States will be seeing whatever on Earth that is and discover, and of course, science news is talking about that, the enigma in the sky, the Milky Way's secret history. Tell them what galaxy means. Yeah, the word galaxy literally means Milky Way. So when people say the Milky Way galaxy, they're actually saying the Milky Way, Milky Way. It's redundant at best. And basically. And then exploring the sky in Scientific American. And is that the one we're talking about today? Uh, No, we're going to talk about the Milky Way, Milky Way. We will be talking about several articles in the recent February 2024 Scientific American. You know, the Milky Way secret history magazine? Here we go. Before we get going, have you subscribed yet? We need you to subscribe. And if you have, thank you. And if you haven't, could you do that right now? Thank you. And comment and like. Oh, you love those comments, don't you? So, yeah, we need comments. Give us good comments. We'll go with this first article. It's from the editor. The Milky Way, Dinosaur Lives and Intelligence. Hey, there's space and dinosaurs. The impact. All together. One of the biggest mysteries. (laughs) I have to laugh. How many articles do they say that it's a mystery in these scientific magazines? Kind of one of my points I wanted to do with this nugget, too many other things that are as good. 
One of the biggest mysteries of the universe is why there is a universe at all. I'm not even going there. And we're talking 2024, not 1604. According to particle physics, the Big Bang should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and they should have immediately canceled each other out. But here we are. We're lucky enough to exist. That's one of their major points, too, the minimization of humanity. Absolutely. It's just always tucked in there somehow. And we get to live in a time when fundamental questions can be asked and potentially answered scientifically. Well, I mean, just think about this. There should have been matter and antimatter in this explosion. Antimatter basically is the same matter that we have now, they say, but it is backwards. Electrons and protons and neutrons are not in the same order. Absolutely no evidence for any of that at all. But God said he's the one that made everything, and that's wherein lies the problem. They have to come up with some kind of an answer because they want to deny God, and that answer doesn't make sense with their own formulas and theories. So they have to come up with new stuff. What it boils down to is they have had to come up with something that is antithetical to the Bible. In Genesis 1, chapter 1, the Lord starts out with saying that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He didn't worry about particles being matter and antimatter. He just made what he made. The next article that we're going to look at quickly is called Erupting Moon. Scientists can say two things with certainty about... Can they say anything for, with certainty? No, what is, how do you say that? I always say I.O., but I don't know how. All right, well, two things with certainty about I.O. I.O., E.I.O. I, sorry about that. First, this moon of Jupiter is the most volcanic object in the known universe. But wait a minute. Are you going to talk about known? What Are, known do means? You, do you remember when I filmed that, that video of Jupiter? With the moons? Absolutely, I do. You remember how small those moons were? Well, yeah. Little bitty dots of light. Go ahead. But let's talk about this known universe. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson himself admits in some of his talks that they do not know about dark energy or dark matter. They just propose it, and it makes up supposedly 96% of everything, and that they only know 4% of what is in the universe. And things like this is what is known. Well, it's not known, is it? No, no. They say they know about all these exoplanets, and they know about the Oort cloud, and they know about all this. Uh, it, there's it, None of that stuff is known. They believe it. Even when they use the word known, as in this case, it's not known. It isn't no. that 4% that Neil deGrasse Tyson speaks of, but they don't know that. They don't know anything about volcanoes. They don't even know where all the volcanoes yeah, well, are on Earth. Yeah, well, let's keep reading. Watch how silly it gets. Its surface is festooned, oh, nice word, with so many lava-spewing calderas that it resembles an oven-baked cheese pizza. Oh, now, now they know what its surface looks like. Now it's making me hungry. It's, I thought it was the moon was made of cheese. Now we got a cheese pizza. Never mind. Okay, back to this. It's glowing rivers of molten rock stretch sinuously from horizon to horizon, and its endless eruptions spray towering arcs of matter into the vacuum of space. Boy, there's a whole lot there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there is. Second, no one really knows the depth of this flashy orb's fiery plumbing. But they know it's there? Are Io's volcanoes fed from reservoirs just underneath its crust? Or does the heat well up from some far deeper source near the moon's metallic core? Now they know it's a metallic core. And did you see that? Solving this mystery. Another article in the same magazine. Peak evolution. Living fossils are constantly evolving. Well, what would you say about living fossils, Steve? Well, it verifies they're not that old in the first place. I mean... <laughs> Humans were killed at the time of the flood also, and there's some in the fossil record that have been found, and we are still alive. What they are saying here is that when they find a fossil and the animal exists today, and they look the same, they don't know what to do with it, so they call it a living no. fossil. All it is is a pre-flood version of that animal that, of the same thing. that died off in the flood, and then it continued on because there were two or 14 of them on the ark, and here we go. Living fossils are constantly evolving. No, nothing evolves, but continuing on. Evolution can perform spectacular makeovers. You know, I think the term evolution is their god. 
Basically, it is. Well, it has to be because that's what the Big Bang caused. I mean, the Big Bang happened and evolution, life started and evolution has taken over from there. In other words, they're worshiping evolution because it has to work. It's done all these amazing things in their mind, just as we see all these things and we worship and honor God of the Bible well, because he is the creator. He is the Elohim. And they're just doing the same thing with this anti-God theory of evolution. Well, yeah. Because you have eyebrows, they say, well, your eyebrows evolved. Because roses have thorns, well, they evolved thorns. Everything evolved in their mind. Evolution can perform spectacular makeovers. Today's airborne songbirds descended from the wingless, earthbound dinosaurs that roamed millions of years ago, for example. Now we <laughs> There's have, one of those known items. <laughs> right. I don't see the word known in no, the, the sentence. No, the word known isn't in there, but it's just so factual, and the other articles about the same thing say that they know it. And we've done a lot of nuggets on this whole dinosaur bird thing, and, and we sort of make fun of it, but that's what they're teaching people. Yeah. And that's what people are believing. And they believe it for some reason. Because they don't have the alternative information of knowing what God says. And it's really sad when we speak with some Christians and they have compromised so much evolution into their faith in God. and, And don't know it. And they're replacing the God of the Bible with the God of evolution and they don't even realize it. But some organisms seem to change very little, even over eons. The coelacanth, a modern-day fish, is nearly identical to its 410-million-year-old fossilized counterparts. And that's a beautiful example. That's what you were just saying. It's the same thing today, so they say, that's nearly identical. It is identical. There were coelacanth before the flood, and there's coelacanth after the flood. The time frame, as I've said many times in our nuggets, you just got to slice off a bunch of those zeros to get to the real time frame. I've just got to keep reading. Scientists have long wondered how these species withstand the pressures of natural selection. The prevailing hypothesis for this status paradox has been that natural selection keeps some species unchanged by selecting for moderate or average traits, so-called stabilizing selection, rather than selecting for more extreme traits that would cause a species to change, direct selection. But a study published in the Proceedings of the Natural Academy of Sciences, USA, contradicts this idea showing that evolution constantly favors differing traits in seemingly unchanging animals that improve short-term survival. In the long term, though, all that evolution cancels out and leads to no change, says the study's lead author, James Stroud, a biologist at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I gotta read one more sentence. Stroud and his colleagues studied four anole lizard species, all relatively unchanged for 20 million years. Well, they didn't study it for 20 million years. But anyway, living on a small island in Florida's Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. We have been to Florida's Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. It's in Coral Gables. It is a beautiful place. And we saw that iguana all around that pond. And then he jumped and he swam in the pond. That was a great thing to see. And unfortunately, we didn't have a good camera. We just caught him on an old phone. And it's not a great video. But it was just so cool. If you're ever in Coral Gables, there's lots to see and go to Fairchild Tropical Botanic Gardens, for sure. But isn't evolution smart? It knows when to change and when not to change. No, evolution is not even a theory. No, it's not. It's not even really a hypothesis. It's just somebody's idea. It's their replacement for the God of the Bible. Yeah, and they call it the theory of evolution. It's not. But the Bible says that everything, repeatedly it says everything, reproduces after its own kind, after its kind. And that's exactly what it does. But notice how Genesis 1.11 starts. I really haven't pointed this out till now, but, and God said. God told everything to do what it's doing. And it does exactly what he told it to do. But again, if it's after his kind, a bird cannot reproduce anything but a bird. A reptile cannot produce anything except for a reptile. The dinosaurs have become the birds is absurd. It you is absurd. cannot believe the Bible. There's no example of any of that kind of thing happening. You just can't compromise with these people. No. Moving on to another article, Our Turbulent Galaxy. Again, out of the same publication. New star maps are rewriting the story of the Milky Way. 
Well, okay, we there go. we go. Mysteries rewriting. rewriting. New star maps are rewriting the story of the Milky Way, revealing a much more tumultuous history than scientists suspected. Well, they're rewriting it again. It's only been rewritten. You know, the, the thing is, notice this one sentence right here. Rewriting and more history than they suspected. Okay, that's great. They're going to change their mind again. Fine, it's not the first time. But everybody that learned whatever it is they learned about any given issue, in this case the Milky Way, they believe what they learned. And now the very scientists who came up with that information no longer believe it. Lost worlds of the dinosaurs. Tiny fossils bring ancient ecosystems to life. We're trying to draw the correlation between the two things that we believe that Satan has used to drive people away and drag people away from the God of the Bible and lure them into compromising with evolution are the dinosaurs and space. That is used these two things the most. There are other things also, but these two are very, very common. And they're sort of subtle. And we don't have anything against dinosaurs. They're very and subtle. we like going to places that have dinosaur exhibits. We love looking at the fossils. We've dug up dinosaur bones ourselves. We enjoy that because we know it's part of God's creation and we love the sky and the stars and looking at all of it. We're not against these things. We are against how they have perverted God's word and what the dinosaurs and what we see in the sky truly is. But what's amazing about these two issues, what people learn about the dinosaurs they believe it. Maybe they don't believe the 65 million year ago thing, but they certainly believe what they're being told about them. But people do the same thing with space issues. I mean, whatever they say, we think, wow, that's so cool. But think about this. You and I will never get to space, and you and I have not seen a dinosaur like they're depicting. So there's no way you can do anything except believe something about these two issues. Next article, The Mystery of Matter. A new experiment helps to explain how matter conquered antimatter. Here we go. A mystery, new experiment, constantly changing. The universe shouldn't be here. Everything scientists know about particle physics, summed up in a theory called the Standard Model, suggests that the Big Bang should have created equal quantities of matter and antimatter. That's everything scientists know about particle physics. We're not even sure that that's, in, that's yeah. where that known That's another falls whole in. issue right there. A mirror version of matter, antimatter, consists of partner particles for all the regular particles we know of, equal in every way but with opposite charge. When matter and antimatter particles collide, they destroy one another. So the mass created when the universe was born should have been completely wiped out, leaving an empty, featureless cosmos containing only light, that there was enough leftover matter after this great annihilation to form galaxies, stars, planets, and even us, but almost no antimatter is known as the matter-antimatter imbalance. This existential anomaly is one of the great outstanding mysteries of modern physics. Okay, we've got so much wrapped up in this that, that we've been time. talking about, but I see this great annihilation. It's order out of chaos. There's no such thing. Yeah, basically what we see here now from a Big Bang. The God of the An Bible explosion. is a God of order, and their God of evolution is the God of disorder. Correct. Look at the next sentence real quick. Physicists have concocted many hypotheses to explain this mismatch, but we don't know which, if any, are true. That's a good point, but somebody's going to believe something that they're taught. They have concocted it. I just they, remembered what I wanted to say. If you have a friend or someone that you... I knew you would remember it, by the way. Go eventually. Ahead. Are Hope you trying to make me forget it again? Hope you didn't forget it now. <laughs> Stop. If you have a friend or a coworker, and you like them, and you believe them, and then you found out that they lied to you about something. But everything else seems to be panning out. But they did lie to you about that one thing. And that one thing was pretty major. Yeah, I was going to say, pretty serious. Huh? And do you trust them anymore? Do you kind of... At least have skepticism. Yeah, you kind of verify everything they've said. And then what happens if you found out that something else they said isn't true? So now they've lied to you twice or misled you. Is your trust going to get any stronger or is your distrust going to grow stronger? It's your distrust. So my question is... What if it happens hundreds of times? And thousands. And in book after book. How much does someone have to lie to you when you finally just 
disregard what they have to say. And with all that said, how often has God lied to you? Zero. God cannot lie. He cannot lie. So we need to be careful. And one of those things is found in Genesis 1, 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Those sound like three different things to me. And why did you stick he that made verse everything. in there? Because Scientific American here, this article says that the universe shouldn't be here. Well, God said he made everything. He made the universe, so to speak. He made the sun, moon, and stars. Oh, I see. Oh, their great annihilation made everything. Yeah, right. God made it. The God of the Bible, not the God of this world and the God of evolution. Next one. Oh, you're going to have fun with this one. Same publication. New view of the Crab Nebula. The James Webb Space Telescope may shed light on the supernova remnants origins. A little more than 969 years ago, on July 4th, 1054... Don't make me laugh. To be precise. <laughs> Light reached Earth from one of the universe's most energetic and violent events, a supernova or an exploding star. Although its source was 6,500 light years from us, the supernova's light was so bright that it could be seen during the daytime for weeks. Various civilizations around the world documented its appearance in records from that time, which is how we know the very day it began. Hundreds of years later, astronomers observing the sky near the constellation Taurus noted what looked like a cloud of mist near the tip of one of the bull's horns. In the mid-19th century, astronomer William Parsons made a drawing of this fuzzball based on his own observations through his 91-centimeter telescope, noting that it looked something like a crab. Maybe if you squint. And the name stuck. We still call it the Crab Nebula today. Nebula is Latin for fog. They are in the fog, aren't they? <laughs> yes, they are. Sorry. We now know. Okay, here we go. Here this we go is that no, know. that 4% no stuff. Just think about it. Do they really know this part? And this isn't that 4% that Neil deGrasse Tyson says they know. We now know that the crab is a colossal cloud of debris that got blasted away from the explosion site of that ancient supernova at 5 million kilometers per hour. Got that stopwatch running? And they know that. In the past millennium, that material has expanded to a size of more than 10 light years across, and it is still so bright that it can be seen with just binoculars from a dark site. It's a favorite among amateur astronomers. I've seen it myself from my backyard. Okay. <laughs> I suggest you go out in your own backyard and look up at the stars and look up at the moon. And then in the day, look at the sun. Well, don't look at the sun. You know what I mean. One last thing I want people to be sure they understand. The Crab Nebula, they say, is 6,500 light years from us. That's what the article says. A light year is just under six trillion miles. So 6,500 times 6 trillion is how far they say this thing is away. That's a bit far, would you say? Especially since today's space telescopes provide no direct view of anything. Anything. April 2019, Scientific American, along with many other articles, actually. And I think we're on our final article. A dinosaur can teach us how to do better science. Well, that'll be nice. Mark Twain once wrote, Did we tell you we've been to Mark Twain's home? It's beautiful. It's in West Hartford, Connecticut. You ought to go sometimes. It does cost a bit. Mark Twain did write a lot of interesting things. Besides his novels, he had a lot of statements that he made, and this is one of his quips. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, bleep, lies, and statistics. He attributed the quip to former British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, but its true origin is unknown. Given the foundational importance of statistics in modern science, this quote paints a bleak picture of scientific endeavors. That's pretty true, isn't it? I'm not sure what either one of us can add to that. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> oh, no, that was great. We'll end with you. We hope you've enjoyed this little bit of an extended nugget. We do flashpoints of different articles, but we wanted to go a little bit more in depth. And as you can see, we didn't really even go much in depth in some of these articles. There's just so much here. As we've said over and over again, put on your critical thinking cap and you can always trust God's word. We can still enjoy talking about, studying about, learning about dinosaurs, space, whatever the issue is. But we have to be cautious about what it is we're learning because it may well be from the God of this world. It may well be from something contrary to what God said he made. 
because we need to know what God says. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. And again, if you haven't subscribed, we would appreciate if you would become a subscriber. And like and comment.